So um, just this is the course on message passing program. I'll explain what message passing program is in the next lecture. The course has been around for a long time. A number of people developed it in the mid to late 90s, and I've taken it on for quite a long time um, since the MSC started actually in 2001. As I said, day one, we're going to cover concepts, basic MPI, point-to-point -point communication, which is the fundamental method of communication in MPI, and a slight technical talk at the end um, um, on, on um, some details of MPI. The second day, we'll talk about um, more technical topics to do with MPI, and as I said, on the third day, we have this case study. All the lectures are followed by a practical session, so, you know, there's practicals to do. I have the sheet printed out here. You'll log on to Archer and do those practicals. Um, I also, there are, if you look on the website, there are solutions. So when I, when I teach this as part of the MSC, I don't give the solutions out, but all the solutions, sim very simple solutions are out there. So I would recommend you work on developing the programs and, and, and getting the concepts, but if you're stuck or, or whatever, just want to look at the answer, there are, there are solutions out there. And uh, as I said, on the final day, some, some more higher level things based around this case study. The case study is an image processing case study, um, which uh, I quite like. So those of you who were here uh, Monday, Tuesday will have done the first program you ran was probably an image sharpening exercise. Was that the? Okay, so this is um, this is a similar, a related exercise to do with edge detection. But I like image processing examples because for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, they produce mainly they produce output. You don't run the program and it says the answer is 73. You get a picture, and actually you'll see that when you're writing message passing programs. Um, it's actually quite a good way to debug it. You could, if you look at the picture and you see how it's wrong, it's often it often gives you a hint as to mistakes you've made. So that's why I quite like it in this context. Um, so on to the first real lecture, which I'm going to talk about um, concepts. So some of you may know this. You may have some background in this, but um, I'm going to talk about concept. Now, this is very important. Um, I know this is a programming course, um, and we will do quite a lot of programming, um, but we won't actually do any programming until after the coffee break. And the reason is that it is really, really, really important to understand the concepts. You'd be surprised at how far people can get with not understanding what they're doing. So they can get through most of day one, a bit of day two, and then halfway that, back, back half of day two, you realize that they, you know, people are writing programs they're running, but they really don't actually understand the model. Now, it's not rocket science, it's quite straightforward, but it is really, really important. Please ask questions here, because this is really important to get these concepts um, sorted out. So what I'll cover is the message passing model, something called SPMD, communications modes, which is a conceptual concept about how you do communication in a parallel program, and a bit about collective communications at the end. So one thing I wanted to say was, MP, uh, message passing is a programming model, a way of thinking about parallel programming. Now, I want to give an analogy here. If this was a course on serial programming, programming in Fortran, Python, C, or something like that, and you'd never done programming before, okay, what would we do? Well, there would be three basic levels to the course. The first thing we would do is we'd talk about basic concepts which are generic across all programming models. The fact that you have arrays, subroutines, variables, you might have object oriented, the fact that source code is human readable, you have control flow if then else, okay? So they're concepts which are completely generic across, effectively across all programming languages and models. Then we might say, well actually, we're gonna be doing Python or Fortran. In Fortran we have if then else, and we have structures and such like. So, so you would then pick a particular language you might want to, that you're learning. So we would teach specific, but they're really just how you do these things in this language, okay? And some languages are particularly designed for OO concepts, some aren't, but you know, there's these concepts and these implementations, then these, 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 these realizations about the programming languages. And then finally, we'd say implementations, okay, we're doing a C, we would teach you to program in C. C is a language specification. C tells you nothing about how to compile a C program on this particular program computer, you might do GCC minus 03, or we might be using the Portland Group C compiler, or the Cray C compiler, or we might be using the Cray Fortran compiler. So these three levels, there's the concepts, which are generic concepts, there's how they're implemented in programming in a language, and how they're realized in a language, and then there's a particular implementation, okay, on my laptop, how do I happen to compile a C program? 
So what we're going to do for message passing parallel programming, which is a way of thinking about programming parallel computers, three levels exist. There are concepts, which I'm going to talk about in this, um, in this lecture, send, receive, processes, SPMD collectives, and a bit about groups. The unusual thing is that there is only really one implementation of these, or what, what one realization of these, which, which is the message passing interface library, the MPI library. Now, for you, that's a good thing. Okay? If, you want to, if you said, I want to learn programming, okay, the first thing people say is, you know, oh, well, what language should I learn? Okay, do I learn, you know, so everyone learns Python, it's trendy. Um, you know, 10 years ago, everyone learned Java, 20 years ago, everyone's learning Perl. So, you know, but, you know, you have to make that choice. And then you might then go away and find out, well, actually, Python isn't really suitable for my HPC program. It runs at 1% of the peak speed or something like that. Or Fortran isn't, isn't, isn't the language I should have learned, so I will do, 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 do one of the lots of text processing. It's good for you, you don't have to make that decision. If you want to program a parallel computer using message passing, which is the standard way they're programmed, you use the MPI library, it's completely universal. However, that wouldn't have been true 20 years ago. I'd have said, you know, there would have been four or five possible competing options in this box. Happens to be MPI has turned out to be the most successful and the one that everyone uses. <coughs> But you should not think about this being an MPI course. You should think about it being a message passing course. And we happen to be using MPI to do it. Because MPI has been very successful. It's very good. But it's not perfect. Okay? It's not perfect. There's some things which are a bit weird. And it's like, just like when you're writing a program, any program, you shouldn't be thinking about the syntax. You should think about what arrays do I need here? What control flow do I need here? How should I split my program amongst files? And then you write it in C, Fortran, Java, Python, whatever. The same thing here. You should be thinking at this conceptual level, which is why this talk is so important. And then saying, OK, I want to send a message. How do I do that in MPI? Okay? Then, having said that, although the library has one definition, one implementation, uh, sorry, one, one definition of the library. There's many implementations. So this is a library. So everyone does message passing programming using the MPI library, but there are lots of implementations of this library. So for example, we'll be using Cray MPI, but there's Open MPI is a very common one, MPI CH2. If you're using an Intel machine, you might use Intel MPI. Um, it doesn't really matter what library you use. You should use you know, the library that is supplied on your particular computer. But it, they're all, this is largely irrelevant. Um, sorry, incredible amount of, of effort has gone in from computer scientists to write these, but you don't care. You don't really care what the library is. It just implements uh, the, the standard. W one thing here, though, has anyone done any shared memory OpenMP programming? Okay, fine. So, unfortunately, about, I don't know how long, maybe five, ten years after MPI came around, there was a lot of um, a lot of versions available, and people say, let's, let's develop an open version. Let's let the develop an open version of MPI. And they called it Open MPI, which was a remarkably stupid choice. Because there is a way of programming shared memory parallel machines called Open MP, which has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Open MPI. They are totally and completely different things. Open MP is a, is a standard for <laughs> compiler implementations of threaded programming. Open MPI is a library for message passing programming. And they could not be more different. But unfortunately, it causes a huge amount. Of, so you'll talk to somebody for 10 minutes, and they'll say they're running, they're running Open MPI. They're not doing Open MP, or they'll do it the other way around. So I only mention that um, just to take a seat anywhere it's fine. So the message passing model is based on the notion of processes. So I, if you did the, the, the course on Monday, Tuesday, you'll know this. But just to think, we're, we're going to program parallel computers here. What is a parallel computer? A parallel computer has lots of physical processors, OK? Archer has over 100,000 CPU cores in it. But if you want a mental model of a parallel computer, the best model you can have is all the laptops in this room connected together by Ethernet or over Wi-Fi. That, that is what a modern parallel computer is like. It's lots and lots of separate computers, like your laptops, all connected together. Okay? That's your mental model. If, we, if you're actually teaching in a training lab with fixed workstations, it, it works a lot better. You can say, imagine all these workstations linked together as being a parallel computer. But a parallel computer is nothing more than lots and lots of individual small computers uh, linked together with some, some network, like these laptops in this room. And the way that MPI works is it's based on the notion of processes. So a process is just an application or a program. When you run a program or an application, it, it, it's in stand state on your computer computer as being an operating system process. So a process is an instance of a program and the program's data. And in the message passing model, parallelism is achieved by having many processes cooperate on the same task. Okay? 
So um, if you have like um, a multi-core laptop, you, it, it can run, it'll have many CPU cores, it can run lots of processes at once. It can run Internet Explorer and um, a video, a game and some, some, some video software all at the same time. But it's running separate things. What we want to do in parallel computing is not run lots of programs at the same speed, we want to run one program faster. What we want to do is have lots of processors, or in this case processes, collaborating to solve the same problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a program on all the laptops in this room, and they're going to have to get together and work to solve a single problem. So each process has only has access to its own data, and that, if you think about it, that's obvious. I'm going to run a program on that computer, a program on that computer. They're completely separate programs. Okay? What MPI message passing is going to allow us to do is to get those programs to talk to each other. But by default, they're just programs running on a computer completely independent of each other. And in the message passing model, processes communicate with each other by sending and receiving messages. And we'll talk about what we mean by that. But typically, the way message passing is, 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 is uh, implemented is it's library calls from conventional sequential language. So the way that MPI works is MPI is just a library, so you can program in C, C++, or Fortran, you can program in Python if you're a bit braver, um, uh, and it's just a library of functions which allow you to do things like send messages between different processes. We could, the message passing could have been implemented as a, li as a new language, and it, it was in the mid early 90s. Uh, however, people don't like learning new languages. I used to say there's only one language which has taken off in the past 20 years, because Python has taken off recently. But it, you know, it takes a long, long time for people and a lot of um, effort for people to learn a new language. And um, because particularly people have a lot of investment in scientific and technical software, you spend a long time writing your program in C, C++, or Fortran, and you want to port it to par make it parallel. You don't want to re-implement it in a new language. You want to extend the current language. And the way that's done with message passing is through a facet of library. So when you write a, a serial program, it's write a normal program, and you compile it and you run it, when you run it, what happens is you launch a process. Okay. So once you run your program, if you look at your um, if I look at the task manager on this thing, uh, we'll see that task manager says I'm running three processes here. Oh, uh, has it it's forgotten my settings, has it? Is it Windows P? Yeah, okay. It's running three it, well it's actually running a lot more than that, but it's running at least it's running three of my processes, Firefox, PowerPoint and the, the recorder. So the important point about processes, the way that modern computers work is that these are completely ring fenced from each other. So they're deliberately isolated from each other. And that's deliberately done so that if I wrote a program and it started to scribble over memory, because I forgot to, I ran off the end of an array, it can't kill my, my PowerPoint or my, or my Firefox or, or scribble over a Word document I have open. Okay? Processes are effectively completely insulated from each other. So. So when you write a program and you launch the process, your mental model is that you have complete control of the processor and the memory. Now that is far from the truth because when you run your program, it may get swapped out. You know, maybe you swapped it and out, and all kinds of weird things may be going on. Your your computer might have multiple processes; it might be moving between processes. That doesn't matter. That's an implementation detail. When you write a normal program, you imagine that your program is running on a processor and it has exclusive access to the memory, and all this is wrapped up in a process which is isolated from everything else. The way that message passing programming works is you run multiple processes. You run it takes four of them: numbered not one, two, and three. And by default, they just run independently. Okay, so what I would do is I'd launch a program on that laptop there, a program on that laptop, a program on that laptop, and a program on that laptop. So I've run four programs, each of which is a process, so we're running four independent processes, and they just run like normal programs. However, if you want to communicate, and we'll come back to exactly what that means, the message passing interface, MPI, gives you an interface to sending messages between these processes. Now, underneath, there will be some physical communications network. On Archer, it's this very, very high spec um, Cray specific Aries network. On a departmental cluster, it might just be Ethernet. 
on a mid-range computer, it might be something like a band. But the important point is you don't care what that layer is. MPI in insulates you from the hardware. Just like when you send an email, you don't care if it's going over Wi-Fi or, 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 you know, or mobile data or, or whatever. So MPI is a software layer which insulates you from, from the hardware. But it's useful to have a model of what's going on. And so I have a picture here of actually the previous supercomputer was called Hector, um, not Archer. But the way that modern computers are built, as I said, is there are a bunch of processors with memory, independent computers. Think of each one of these as being your laptop, which has a processor and some memory. And they're connected together with some interconnect. As I said, this interconnect could be just something very uh, cheap and cheerful, like Ethernet, or it could be something very expensive and high spec, like um, an Ares, the Cray Ares network. But um, the way we're going we're gonna to do parallel programming is we're going to run separate processes, we're going to run multiple copies of our program on all these machines, and MPI allows us to communicate over the network. Okay? Is that, is that clear? So the way it works is if I want to send, I want to, so I, I've run two processes, okay? So I have a program running on that laptop and a program running on that laptop over there, and they want to communicate with each other. We want to, we don't want them to run independently. We want to, 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 them to collaborate to solve some bigger problem quicker, do weather forecasting or some fluid dynamic simulation or something like that. So we want one process to send a message to another process. So process one has some line eight of 23, and process one wants to communicate this value process two. Okay. So what happens? Well, first of all, A is set to be 23 in the in the in the, the memory, the data region of the first process, which is totally separate from the data for the second process. Um, so imagine imagine process one is running on your laptop and process two is running on a laptop somewhere in Australia. Okay, think of an extreme condition like that. I want to communicate this data from here to here. There's no way that this process can directly read the memory of, of this process. There's no way that that laptop can read the memory of that laptop directly. Okay? It's just not possible. So what happens in message passing is you're given some magic function, and we'll see what these are called in MPI. I call it here send, where you say, I want to send this value A to process 2. Okay? And the way this works, you can think, we'll come back to these analogies, but... Um, you can think of message passing as parallelism through sending emails, or you can think of it as being like making phone calls. Okay, there are various analogies here. But here I'm thinking of kind of an email, an email analogy. So, and that's quite a good analogy. Process one is communicating with process two by sending an email. So I'm going to send you an email um, containing some data. Okay. So if I want to communicate with uh, with you, if I send you an email, has that communicated the information? that enough? <coughs> yes or no? You need to receive. You need to receive. Or in email, you need to <coughs> read it. But you're, that's really important. So the really important thing is in message passing, message passing is a two-ended process where the, the sender actively sends, but the receiver has to actively receive. And it's the same analogy as saying, if I send someone an email, I have achieved nothing unless they actually read that email. Okay, so it needs to be co cooperation on both sides. And that's why I've drawn it here, kind of going into what you can think of as being an inbox here. Okay? This has sort of gone into some kind of inbox on process two. But for process two to receive this data, it has to explicitly issue a receive. So process one says, I want to send the value A to process two. And it does not say, it cannot say, where in process two's memory it's supposed to go. Because process two is in charge of certain memory. <coughs> is at the receive stage, process two says, I'd like to receive a message from process one, and I will put it into my variable B, okay? And at that point, the communication is taking place, that process two's value of B is equal to 23. Then process two could do something like this, A equals B plus one, and its value of A is 24. So this illustrates two things. One is the, the two-sided um, nature of message passing, that the sender has to actively send and the receiver has to actively receive. But also, that variables are private. Just because that laptop has a variable A and that laptop has a variable A, they're not the same variables A. Okay? They're not the same. So the A on process 1 can be 23, and the A on process 2 can be 24. And that might sound like a trivial observation, but it does become, it can become quite confusing. And so simple questions you'd like to ask 
what is the value of A are meaningless in a parallel MPI program. They're completely meaningless. You have to say, what is the value of A on process three, on process seven? Now, you may have arranged that this variable has the same value on every process. You may have arranged that, but by, by default, just because the variables have the same names don't mean they have the same values, because they're local to each process, local to each computer. Now, this may be slightly more confusing because the model we use is something called SPMD. Almost all message passing systems, and an MPI is one of them, use a single program multiple data model. So what you do is you run, you write one program. Okay? You write a single piece of source code, and you compile it, and all processes run their own copy of that program. So it's not the same program, but it's a copy of the same program. It's like me writing a program and literally launching the program over there, installing it on that machine, launching it there, installing it on that machine, launching it there. You run multiple copies of the same program. But they all have, each process has a separate copy of the data. Now you might say, well, each, if, each, if I run this multiple copies of the same program, why don't they all do the same thing? Well, you have access to one magic variable, and we'll see how to do this MPI. You can ask, who am I? Okay? You can say, what process am I? And it turns out in MPI, you get a number back, not one, two, three. And once you've got that number back, you can do different things. Okay? So the programs are identical, but they can do different things, because the first line you can have is, well, if I'm process three, do this, else if I'm process four, do something else. So that's how message passing works. Um, process can then follow a unique control path through the program, depending on their ID. So that, um, it's actually quite a good model. It works very well. It works very well um, um, for two reasons. First of all, if I'm going to run 100,000, if I'm going to run 100,000 processes on Archer, I'm not going to want to write 100,000 programs. Okay, that's going to be a bit, a bit um, onerous. I want to write one program and run it 100,000 times. But secondly, the way that most scientific and technical programs work is the programs are the same. If I want to, to simulate the weather, I want to write a weather forecasting program to simulate the weather. Okay. What the standard way you would do it is you would take a map of, I'm going to do a terrible map of, 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 of Great Britain, um, and you would, that's supposed to be Scotland up there, uh, you might split Great Britain into four pieces and say, well, I want one process to simulate that piece, one process to simulate that piece, one process to simulate that piece, and another process to simulate that piece. The equations to simulate the weather are the same. It doesn't matter where you are. You are running the same equations. But the data is different because the topography is different here. You have different initial conditions and different weather here. So you're running a single program, but they have, it's called single program multiple data because each program has its own data, its local data. But because most scientific and technical codes work like that, but the equations are solving the same everywhere, uh, this model works very well. There are situations where you might think it doesn't work, a classic um, uh, model in, in simple parallel model in the message passing, which we'll explore in the first exercise, is called a task file. And this is, can be useful in certain situations. You have a controller and a worker. So I might be the controller, you guys are all the workers. I'm just giving you out work, okay? Get you to do work, and then you return me the work, and when you're finished, I give you out more work, okay? So it's one controller and lots of work. You might say, well, there, well, clearly why I want two programs there. I want one program for the controller process, and I want lots of, which, you only run one copy of that, and you run lo lots of copies of the worker process. Well, in the SPMD model, it's very simple. You just write a single program in C or Fortran, and you just say, if I'm the controller process, then I control the, call the controller function, and also I call the worker process. So if you want to run different programs, you just effectively make them different functions or subroutines in the same program. Because the important point is, although every process, be you a controller or a worker, is running the same program, based on your ID, you can take different paths in that program. So, you, so now, the other question you might like to ask is, uh, you might like to ask, what is the value of A? I told you that's a meaningless question. You might also ask, what, what line is my program on? That's a meaningless question as well. Because every copy of the program could be a different line. You may have written your program such that they have to be the same line, but A priori, Every program can be a different line. So yeah. that, again, can make debugging very difficult. In four times, it's just the same. So I've talked a lot about messages. I haven't really said what they are. In MPI, um, well, a message transfer is a number of data items of a certain type from the memory of one process to the memory of another. And sending an email is, is, is a good analogy in, in this context. However, in MPI, it's important to realize that messages are quite uh, 
quite low level basic objects. A message in NPI is 10 integers, or five real numbers, or 57 characters. They are not objects or classes or anything higher level like that. We will see we can build up slightly more um, complicated data structures in MPI, but fundamentally a message in MPI is six integers. Okay? So in that MPI doesn't really map very well onto object oriented programming. It's not it is quite relatively low level. Um, I'll come back to how you you, you, you do everything you do call it from C or C from C plus plus later on. Um, and when you send a message um, the message has the data, but it also has other stuff on it, which is kind of metadata. And we'll come back to how this is done in MPI. You might have the ID of the sending process, where it's going. You might have the type. You might want to know how, how many data items it is. Then the data itself, and you might have some identifier. The analogy here is, you know, when you get a, a letter through the door, you might get um, bills come in red envelopes, and, and normal correspondence comes in white envelopes. So the majority of the message is the data, might be a gigabyte of data or something, but there is other information, this metadata, this header information, which is very like, as I said, um, yeah, which, which, is, um, which is like the information on the envelope or the postcard or, or the header in an email, that kind of thing. We'll come back to how that's done in MPI. So one thing I wanted to cover here, which again is a conceptual thing, is communications modes. So this is quite an important thing to get your head around. I said that... Um, Sending a message in MPI was conceptually very similar to sending an email or making a phone call. But sending an email or making a phone call are conceptually completely different ways of communicating. If I send an email, I just send it and I don't care if the other person is even logged on. If I make a phone call, I wait for the person to pick up. And in, in message passing, those are called synchronous and asynchronous methods of communication. And again, we'll see later how these are implemented in MPI. But synchronous send is not completed until the message has started to be received. Okay? So that's like making a phone call. Okay? An asynchronous send completes as soon as the message has gone. So this is like, you know, if, if I was rich enough to have a sec if I was important enough to have a secretary, I could say to my secretary, uh, I want you to, 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 um, to send a letter to a colleague or send an email to a colleague, and he might go off and do that. If he comes back and says, I have sent the email or I have sent the letter. I would just assume that he had pressed send or put the email or put the letter in the post, okay? Because it's an asynchronous operation. Completing the operation does not include delivery, okay? Completing asynchronous send is just like hitting send in an email. However, I said to my secretary, I want you to phone somebody, and he came back and said, yes, I have phoned them. That means something completely different. It means that he has actually spoken to the other person. So completing synchronous send means that the, 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 the messaging operation is actually taking place. So they're conceptually different ways of sending messages. And we'll see that uh, in MPI that you can do both. And there are some technicalities to do with that which are unfortunate, uh, which I'll cover in the final lecture today. In MPI, receives are usually synchronous. The receiving process must wait until the message arrives. And actually, in MPI, uh, when you receive a message, you just stand there and wait for it to come in. Okay, so you, you, you just wait forever. If there's no, if there's no, um, and that, that's the major problem in MPI. If you post a receive and there's no matching send, that receive will wait there forever. Okay, and so it's very, very easy to write simple programs in MPI that what we call deadlock. They just stop working because you've issued a receive and there is no matching send. Now there are ways to. to, to um, combat deadlock, and we'll cover that a bit in um, tomorrow, technicality, technical ways. But it's really important to understand the concept in MPI. When you issue a receive by default, you sit there and you wait for the message to come in. It's your responsibility as a programmer to have written a correct program such that sometime in the future, somebody sends a message and, and, and it matches. Okay? And there are no timeouts in MPI. People are often surprised by that. But if you issue a receive and there's no send, then that receive will wait for it forever. Okay? The process will just sit there forever, waiting for the message to come in. And if there is no message coming in, your program will probably stop working. So as I said, synchronous send, this is an old slide. In the old days when faxes didn't scan things, um, sending a fax was like, um, was like was synchronous, in the sense that you put the fax in the fax machine, you waited, you <coughs> dialed the other machine, and let, sometime later you got the beep. And that beep was very important. That was your acknowledgement that the facts had been sent to Australia or whatever. 
actually, I should probably update the slide. I think making a phone call is probably the, the, the useful, uh, maybe a better analogy nowadays. Asynchronous send is exactly like posting a letter. You only know when the letter has been posted, not when it has been received, or like sending an email. Um, that you, you, you post the letter, and you, you, it is hopefully delivered by MPI. If you think of the MPI as being like a postman, but you don't get any, um, you don't get any, um, you don't a priori know if it's been delivered. You have the information. Yep. Is it guaranteed that it will actually arrive? So, right, so that's a very good question. So, so yes. So, the, one of the reasons that MPI isn't well, so I can come back to the MPI um, is written for um, for performance to allow you to get good performance out of large power machines. You spend fifty million pounds on a power machine, you want to get some performance out of it, and so it is not MPI is not fault tolerant in the sense MPI assumes that the network is perfect and the processes are always working. That enables it to be much more efficient. It doesn't have to spend all its time worrying about whether things have worked or not. So yes, there'll be some technical definition in the standard um, in sort of um, computer ease. Uh, but yes, there, the, the message will be delivered. Okay, if, if there's a receive posted, there's no. But you don't have to. There is no concept in MPI of <coughs> you can tell. There's no concept. You don't have to check. Okay, you know, the assumption is you've written the correct program, which is why there are no timeouts. The assumption is, you know, if you've issued a receipt, you have issued a send. But also, yes, there are guarantees that messages will be will be delivered. Okay. Another question you can ask is message ordering. If I if I send two letters to the same destination, they don't necessarily arrive in order. You might ask, well, what's end goal? We'll come back to that. That's a quite subtle point, but it's quite important. Um, so. That's point-to-point -point messaging. Point-to-point uh, -point communications, we have one sender and one receiver. It's called point-to-point -point communication. It's the simplest form of message passing. It relies on matching sender and receiver. And I said a good analogy is sending personal emails or letters or making phone calls. Synchronous versus asynchronous. However, there are many situations where this is not the most efficient thing to do. So for example, I could deliver this, this lecture through point-to-point -point messaging. Every time I wanted to say something, I could whisper it in the person's ear in turn, okay, tell them what the next, that, that works, okay, that would deliver the information, but it's very inefficient. So there are many situations where you actually want to do more global things, which are collective, which involve not just a sender and a receiver, but a large collection of, of processes in this case. And in MPI, they're called collective communications. A simple message communicates between two processes, but there's a lot of instances where communication between many processes, where between groups of processes is required. Now, of course, these could be built from simple messages. I, I, I could do, I could do this this um, this lecture by by doing a point to point message for everybody, but it's not efficient. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to the efficiency of that communication later on. Um, there is something that the, they may not think of this communication, but it is a, a useful concept. Um, there are barriers in MPI. You can call a global operation which says, look, everybody wait. Nobody go past this point. It's a line in the sand. Nobody go past this point till you've all arrived, OK? So nobody proceeds to ask the barrier until they've all arrived, OK? That sounds like a very useful thing to be able to do. However, I may come back to this later, but in MPI, in MPI problems, you almost never need to do this. It's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not an obvious not an obvious thing at all, but in MPI programs you almost never do it. If you see an MPI program with a barrier in it, I would say there's a 99% chance it's not needed. The person has just put it in there because they think it's necessary. But it's, you know, it's, it's quite a subtle point. We can come back to remember we've done more about MPI, but it's very, very difficult to think of anything other than contrived situations where barriers are necessary. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, broadcast, that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm broadcasting. It's a one-to-all communication. And you might often want to do this at the start of a program. Now, the important point about this is, in MPI speak, we are all participating in the broadcast. <coughs> a collective operation requires everybody takes, play, take, takes part. So we are all participating in the broadcast. Within that broadcast, we have different roles. I'm, I'm sending information, and you're hopefully receiving information. But technically, we are all participating in the broadcast. And one of the biggest mistakes people make is they, they say they only issue the collective communication on one process. And that it cannot work. 
Because in message passing, everything has to be collaborative. Everything requires, even with collective communications, the active ta- participation of sender and, and receiver. So this is the classic thing you might do at the start of a program. You might read in some small parameter file. On one process, let's say, you have about eight, might be how many iterations are we going to do. You read that one on one process, and you broadcast it to everything. Everybody gets the value of okay? That's a broadcast. Scatter is a bit like a broadcast, but the information is scattered. So you have some data, not one, two, three, four, five, and rather than sending, if, you, if I broadcast that data, everybody would get a copy of the whole array, not one, two, three, four, five. But often I don't want to do that, often I want to split the data up. So I might have, you know, read in the map of the UK, Great Britain, sorry, Great map, map of Great Britain, um, and I want to split it up amongst, pro- I, only, I only want to send a, a separate portion of the data to each process. And in message passing, that's called a scatter. You take a data array, you don't copy to every process, you subdivide and give a separate section to each process. So if I scattered that array rather than broadcast it, then I would get not one, two, three, four, five across the um, across the process. And again, that's something you often do at the start of a program. You read in some big data array and you, you partition it up. Again, clearly you could do that via point-to-point communications. You could individually send data to each person, but it's much more efficient to um, to, to, to do. You should always call collective operations because they will be implemented efficiently. I mean, a, a simple example I have is I have a bunch of exercise sheets I'm going to give out. Okay. Yep. And if I wanted to give these out, I could go around and give a single copy to everybody, okay? And let's say there's 25 of you. Say it takes me, let's say for the argument, say one second to do it. Okay, that's going to take me 25 seconds, okay? What's a more efficient way of distributing these sheets than me giving one to everybody? Simple. Let somebody pass the number. Yeah. So yes, but so, so I would nominate a boss guy on each table and I would give a block to each. So how long would that take? Well I would have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tables. Okay. Then there's maybe four of you on each table, so then that's another three messages on each table. But the important point is that second part takes place in parallel. Yeah. Once I've given so that would take ten seconds. Not 25. So even simple operations like this can be implemented much more efficiently than the naive way of doing it. And the, the reason that the MPI elevates these operations into, into these higher level um, concepts is it, it allows the MPI library to do them efficiently, do them in an efficient way. So you should always, if there is a collective routine which does what you want, you should always call it because it will be faster than anything you can write yourself. The people have worked for years on this. And, and um, often parallel program isn't rocket science, it's just common sense, okay? It's much e- quicker for me to put a block of, 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 of um, exercise sheets on each table and let you distribute them amongst yourself than it is for me to go and give them one to everybody, okay? Gather is the inverse of scatter at the end of a simulation. I want to say, right, I want to write the data, I want to write, uh, write out the, the weather across Great Britain, I want to gather it all back to a single process. Um, that, that does the inverse of scatter. The most important one, though, is a reduction operation. So, I mean, the classic thing, if you look at this map here of Great Britain, is if I wanted to know the total rainfall across Great Britain, okay, the way it works in message passing, everyone only has access to their own data. So the process zero only knows the weather forecast, the weather, um, the, the rainfall over the top left-hand corner of, 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 the, of Great Britain. Bot top, uh, bot top right, bottom right, bottom left. Each process only has its own number. The weather forecast across, the, the, the total rainfall across the bottom left-hand corner of, the, of Great Britain is a meaningless number. The only number is, is, the, is the total, meaningful number of the total rainfall. And what you want to do there is you want all these guys to add their numbers together. Okay? That's called the reduction operation. Everybody has their own data, but you produce one result. Another example might be the average age of everybody in this room. To work out the average age of everybody in this room, I would add together all your ages and then divide by the number of people. But it's a reduction operation because it takes distributed data. Everybody has their own age. Okay, so each process has its own age. But there's one answer, which is the average age. So it reduces that data in parallel to produce a single result. Another example might be, you know, um, um, about you know, an, an, an election of some sort, a referendum, for example, where um, you know everyone has their own vote, um, and we. we um, the majority rule, and everyone's happy with the majority rule. So, uh, but so it turns out in, in, in scientific and technical programming, the thing you do almost all the time, 
you need to do are, are production operations where you add numbers together because each process can only com compute the result for its local data but often the only meaningful result is, is the aggregate across all the processes and again you should call the, the collective computing. So a global sum product match men. So if I, if I summed up all these numbers, what 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 I get, what is it, 15? Yes, I get 15. So just to get the concepts sort of um, instantiated, the way it works when you write a message passing program is you write a single piece of source code. You write one program in C, C++, or Fortran. So who's going to be programming in Fortran? Does that have interest? And C or C++? Okay, so it's a bit, the answer, okay, a bit more. So MPI is effectively neutral between CC++ and Fortran. There's a few technical differences, but not, not a big deal. Um, and you, 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 re, you write calls to message passing functions such as send and receive. So I call them send and receive in my example. We'll see what they call in the MPI. You then compile with the standard compiler. So people, people often say that MPI is a language. MPI is not a language. MPI is a library. Okay? So when you compile your program, your compiler, you can use GCC or Intel C compiler or Cray Fortran, whatever you like. That compiler has no idea what these what these function calls do. It's, it sees a function call to send to send a message. That could be making your screen flash green or your keyboard go beep for all it cares. Okay? It's just a library call. Okay? So the compiler can give you zero help because these are just library calls. But hopefully the, the compiler knows what the prototype, what the data types are, how many arguments there are. They have no idea what it does. So you compile with a standard compiler, and you link to a message passing library. As I said, there are open source ones. If you want to install MPI on your laptop, you might stick open MPI on it. If you're running on the Cray, you would use the Cray MPI library because it's been optimized for the Cray. But you don't really care here. It's like you shouldn't really care what C compiler you use. If you've written a correct C program, it will compile with any compiler. So then you have one executable, okay? You then run multiple copies of this executable on a parallel machine. Each copy is a separate process, each has its own private data, each copy can be a complete different line in the program, so we're trying to initiate that. Now, you could do this by logging onto that laptop and running the program, copying onto the laptop, <coughs> logging on and running the program, copying onto the laptop, and that can be fairly arduous. And all, all message passing systems, the MPI in particular, gives you a launcher program. So what you do is you write your executable, then you say, please run n copies of this executable, and it will distribute them across the, 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 the different machines and start them running and get them talking to each other. And um, on the Cray, it's called something called AP run, app run. You may have used that if you were here Monday and Tuesday. Um, so that, that, that's, the, um, that, that, that's the flow through how things work. What are the issues? Send and receive must match to the danger of deadlock, and the program will store forever. So that's that's important. You have to write um, you have to write a correct program. It's possible to write very complicated programs, but actually most scientific and technical codes have a relatively simple communication structure, <coughs> relatively straightforward, and it often results in simple communication paths. And because of that, often these would have been elevated to. Uh, if you say right, I want everyone to get together and add a number up, then um, we'll, uh, that will actually be one of our examples we'll do by hand. But you shouldn't really do it by hand. You should call a collective operation. So, so a lot of the communications patterns that you see in scientific and technical programs have, are already in, uh, implemented in MPI as these collective operations. Um, and that's because MPI was designed for scientific and technical programs. So summary message is the only form of communication. All communication is therefore explicit. If you're not calling a message passing function, then you are just a program running on some computer doing your own thing. Most systems use this SPMD model, single program, multiple data. All processes run exactly the same code. Each has a unique ID, but you can take different branches. And the basic communication pattern is point to point. Uh, but collective communications are higher level, and they implement these more complicated patterns. Um, so just to, message passing is a programming model. Message passing is a way of thinking about parallel programming. What you say is, I have a lot of processors. They're each running a copy of my program. And when I want them to communicate, they will send messages to each other. But message passing is implemented through MPI. The message passing interface is a library of functions or subroutine calls. It's really essential to understand these basic concepts, that you have private variables. And that, that people often um, um, get confused about this, but you know, 
just because you have a variable x, every process will have its own copy of x. So you write int x or float x. You have to remember if I run on 10,000 processes, there are 10,000 copies of x. Okay, each process has its own copy. All communication is explicit, and you have this SPMD model. Um, as I said, although you'll make mistakes with the syntax and such like, because the MPI syntax is a bit long-winded in places and, and stuff like that, you know, the major difficulty, I think, some people don't have an issue with this, some people it's completely natural, they don't have any problems, some people find it a bit more difficult to get their head around this. Um, the major difficulty is understanding the message passing model. It's a very different model to sequential program. Um, so, for example, um, if I just have this line in, in, in some pseudo language here in my in my serial program, I've got to bear with x. It's the rainfall, okay? And it has to be positive. Obviously, rainfall is positive. So I have a check. If x is less than zero, then print error and exit. Okay? That's the perfect reasonable thing to do in a serial program. Why is that a dangerous thing to do in a parallel program? Why that? that those, those lines of code are dangerous in the parallel program. Code. So yes. Yeah, so why? Why might you get deadlock? Yeah. So the value of x can be different on different processes. So that's the first point. So some of the processes may have positive x's and some may have negative. So about this, imagine that one process has a negative x. It stops. Okay. But then, okay, so it stopped. But the other guys aren't stopping, they're carrying on. So what's going to happen later on? They're going to be expecting a message from this process that stopped. So they're going to receive and there's going to be no message, okay? So this, this is a dangerous thing to do a message passing because X can have different, will, or can, and in general will, have different values in each process. And here, if only a subset of the process is stopped, then your program will, all the other guys will carry on. And then, um, so what, what, so how, how could you get around to that? Yeah, but then there's a problem is that so you do a send. You say you send you send the message. So I'm stopping, but they can only get they can only get that message if they actively receive it. So they all so, so this is actually actually quite a nasty thing to do. So this they all just send a message. Well, but the important part of MPI is me, me, it's not interrupt driven. You don't send a message and suddenly it pops up going you know somebody's trying to speak to you. You can only receive a message if you actively receive it. So it's actually quite difficult to cover the situation. Okay. What the best thing to do here, we can come back to this, would be to do a collective communication. Okay, you would set a flag, which was one if there's an error and zero if everything was okay. You could do a reduction operation, add them all up, and if you didn't get zero, you'd say, well, somebody had a problem here. We should all stop. But it's even simple things like this are not trivial to get around because you say you'd like to send a message to somebody, but unless they're actively receiving, then they're not going to get that. So it, it can be surprisingly difficult to run and to get around. Um, I realized that in my haste, I missed one slide. So the aims of this course are a practical course to teach to understand the message passing model, which I've just talked about, and to write parallel programs in C04 channel, C++ using MPI. I've talked about lectures and notes, but I said most importantly, writing an XCT exam for MPI program. So we said each lecture has an associated practical, which as I said, you can go through, that's what I'd recommend, but there are solutions there. I will say it's much more important, don't rush ahead to go to the next exercise, the next exercise. It's much more important to finish this course with half the exercises completely done than all of them half done. Okay? Because if you rush ahead, you'll miss the concept. So just, you know, the, the demonstration say, just go back. Don't feel any pressure to go on to the next exercise, the next exercise. If you if you're still working on the previous one, you know, just carry on working on that one. It's much more important to get a solid understanding of the basic concept than to run ahead and do some of the more advanced examples. Why? The MPI library is the most important piece of software in parallel programming. All the world's largest supercomputers are programmed using MPI. I mean, I, the, if you look at uh, Archer, I mean, I don't know, 99 point, I mean, you know, every program, almost almost every program run on Archer will use MPI. You know, you're talking 99.9% .9 of the programs running on parallel supercomputers use MPI at some, at some level. And I think writing parallel programs using MPI is fun. It is, as I said, it is a different. It is a different way of thinking about programming because you have multiple processes collaborating, and um, because of that, um, you, you can get caught by these some of these issues. Like I thought, the you know that fx less, less than zero thing, and, and it gets you to think in a different way. And I think that's quite, quite important. Also, more importantly, now I mean I have this would have been jumped into if you're here on Monday and Tuesday, but all computers are parallel computers now. 
you, you, you buy a laptop, it will have two or four CPU cores in it, whether you want it or not. Nobody wants two or four CPU cores in their laptop. No sane person wants that. A sane person wants a CPU which is two or four times faster. And unfortunately, that's the way the world is. Processors are not getting any faster. If you want your program to get faster, you have to buy more processors. That's all you can do, okay? Unless you believe in quantum computing. But, so I'm going to do. So what I'm going to do before the break is going to do a thought example, which hopefully illustrates the concept of mental class. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. How expensive is one piece of communication? So there's been noise. I didn't quite get that. How expensive is one? Oh, that's what. So one of the exercises is to measure that. But on something like Archer, um, to to send a, to send a message between two processors. The, the, the time taken is, 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 is a few microseconds. Then plus bandwidth, you know, then there'll be some, some so to send any data, there's a latency and overhead of, of a few microseconds, to say, and then you'll have some bandwidth, and then on Archer that'll be of order, I don't know, 10 gigabytes a second, something like that, those are the, the numbers. But on, on a less, before, on Ethernet, if you just had a, you know, deep poverty cluster, you'd be talking about hundreds of microseconds, ten, many tens of microseconds. And that is an important number because even on Archer, which has you know, one of the fastest networks there is, two microseconds, your, your, your processor is, is operating at gigahertz. So microse a microsecond sounds like a small amount of time, but it is thousands of CPU cycles. So sending a message takes thousands of CPU cycles, even on a very, very um, um, bespoke and dedicated parallel machine. So the, the absolute... Um, um, mantra in MPI programming is send a small number of large, send as few messages as possible, send a small number of large messages, but the easiest way to do that is to call these collective communications, because that, that, that is what they will have done, they will have optimized that. But yes, so, so on, uh, the, the ballpark number on Archer is, is, is a few microsecond latency and, and bandwidth of maybe 10 gigaseconds, and something like that, that kind of ballpark. So I'm going to give this traffic model which I quite like. Uh, I'm afraid the animations may not work. Um, but because I'm having to use that, so I'm having to use different kits here. But I think this is useful this is a useful um, a useful exercise um, to illustrate uh, parallel computing. So um, we want to predict traffic flow. Uh, predicting traffic flow is um, very um, useful because we want to, for example, uh, avoid, this was an animation of some, some congestion in Bangkok, we want to look for effects of this congestion. Now you can imagine, tra predicting traffic flow is very like weather forecasting, in the sense there's, 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 there's two ways you might do it. For a short term, a short term traffic um, model might be saying, well, um, th th this, this evening, okay, there's going to be a lot of traffic in Edinburgh, how can I um, change the lights or maybe open an extra lane to, to, to relieve that? That's like a short-term weather forecast. You know, is it going to rain tonight kind of thing? So that, that, that's very useful for kind of short-term planning and traffic management. You can alter speed limits and stuff like that. Longer term, you might want to say, OK, we've just built a new bridge across the fourth. What effect is that going to have on the traffic? That's like climate modeling. You know, what, what, if, what, 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 what we're going to have to do in 10, 15 years' time to cope with the volumes of traffic. So traffic model is quite an interesting topic. Um, you build computer models. This was a computer model run many years ago to help design the new bridge roundabout between the Antifa and Meadow. But I'm going to do the most simple thing you can imagine. I'm going to do a simple traffic model as a seller automaton. I'm going to divide the road into a series of cells. Now, these lectures came actually from a public understanding of science lecture I gave maybe 10 years ago. So there's, there's sort of a few poor attempts at humor in it and a few animations of the slightly different style from my other lecture. So, and the cell is either occupied or unoccupied. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cells, and three of them are occupied with these cars. And we have a very, very simple rule. Full number of steps. Each step, a car moves forward if it can and not if it can't. So a car moves forward if the, if the space ahead is empty and not if it isn't, okay? And this is an instantaneous update. You don't say, oh, that car moves, therefore that one can move. You say, look, that car can move, that one can't, and that one can, and then you move them. Okay, so it's like an instantaneous update. So in that situation, that's what can happen there. The first car can move, the second one can't, the third one can. 
The next iteration is the first car that can't move and the other two can. And then once you get this car gap, car gap situation, they all move off happily. Um, that's, and I'll come back to this, but you could do this by moving one to a chessboard, which is a really useful analogy. But it has a number of interesting features. It predicts the right behavior at traffic lights. So if you've got a bunch of cars at traffic lights and the lights go green, what happens is they move off. You don't get, they don't move off to the block. They move off like cars really do, one by one. And if we compute the velocity of the cars, which is the number of cars that move divided by the total number of cars, in other words, Max, if, if you velocity one, average velocity one means that every car moves, that's what happens in this situation. Um, and we plot it against the density of cars, you get the nice graphics. If you plot the average, so you run this model, you write a program and run this model, and you plot the average speed of the cars against the density, you get quite a nice effect that below 50% filling, at some point, this is this is a really natural toxic result. You've run the model for quite a long time. At some point, if there are if, if less than half the cells are filled, the cars eventually arrange themselves into car gap, car gap, and they move at speed one. Okay, clearly at 100% filling, nobody can move, but but congestion sets in quite quite rapidly at 50% filling, surprisingly rapidly. Now, actually, this is this is kind of a trivial model. It's very very useful to illustrate the concepts. Computationally trivial because if you've done physics, you can see this as being electrons and holes that below 50% filling, if you think of these being charged carriers, electrons, the electrons move from the right with velocity one. But if you imagine all the car, all, 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 all the cells full except for a gap, it's actually the gaps that move to the left with velocity one, which is like um, charge, charge carriers and holes and semiconductor physics. So actually, this is actually a trivial model if you think about it. But anyway, you get these really nice results. Um, that's just an aside. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in practice, use a more complicated model, but this is a nice one we'll do. Now, um, when I do this on the MSC, it's a more extended exercise, and I, I get people to think about the term cellar automaton, but I won't do that here. I mean, basically, a cellar automaton, you cast um, your update rule as how does the value of a cell depend on the old, so you have a bunch of time steps, okay? On each time step, the new value of a cell depends on the value of the previous cells. And here it depends on the, on the value at time, at time step t plus 1. The value of cell n depends on the values of cells n minus 1, n and n plus 1. And you can fill in the state table, but it's fairly it's rather overblown. It's kind of obvious if you go through it. But in this, in this, case, the, 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 the ups, the, in this case, the new value is, is full because it couldn't move. In this case, the new value is empty because it did move, and here it's the same thing. And th so there are eight possible states. I have three cells, each of which can have two states. So um, um, there are two, to, um, th there's two, three, eight possible states. This completely defines the cellular automaton model. If you want to think about it that way, you can write this as a truth table if you want. But actually, I think it, um, I'll come back and try this. But what we're interested here is how, how fast can we run this model, okay? So you, you'll know that the, the performance Supercomputers is for any computer for science and technical programming is measured in terms of flops, floating point operations per second. So convenience is car operations per second, which turns out to be cops. So if I wanted to run this model, so I've got someone who's a good chess player, this is Bobby Fisher, who is a somewhat eccentric uh, chess master in the 70s, um, when the, the US and Russia fought each other by playing chess, and frankly didn't lock weapons at each other. But if we update, if I had a, if I had a chess board, I'm going, to, I'm going to simulate this model by hand. I have a chess board, and I have chess pieces on it. I'm going to move them by hand. How fast can I operate it? Well, if you think about it, I reckon that a chess player or me could operate, could update this about two cops, about two car operations, for each half a second from each car. That's a kind of a reasonable, reasonable feeling. But what about three people? Can three people run the model at six car operations per second? So let's think about this. So this is my model, and we're going to talk about parallel type modeling. And the exercise, which I'll start now, and we can think about it over the break, and I'll maybe come back to after the break, is that we have a road of length 15, okay? And we split it up. So this is the, the message passing model. We have three people, each with their own private data. So each person here, person A, person B, person C, has their own little chess board, which only has five cells on it. Now, we're thinking of this as being a long road of length 15, but actually each process, 
each person only has a little chessboard with five cells on it. And we want these people to update them. Now, I used to give these people ident identities. But then I, then I, I decided I couldn't. This was David Cameron, and this was Alex Salmon. But then I had to update it each time somebody resigned on. Um, so I, but then this person said that these just stock him. That looks suspicious, like Donald Trump. That is a, that is a, a complete coincidence. It's just one of the color combinations on the word clip art. Now, immediately you see a problem in, in the distributed model that this may not show up very well. I hope it does on your screens. That person A has a problem. Okay. Person A doesn't know if they can move this car because they don't know if there's a car here. Okay. So we have a problem. And also, person B has a problem. Donald, let's call him, doesn't know if he can move his car. Person C has a problem as well, because they don't know if they should, if they should put a car here, because they don't know what's going on. So immediately, we see a problem. So you see immediately, even in this very, very simple model, if we parallelize it in the message passing model, which we have private data, we need to do communications. And so what happens is, per persons A and B have to talk to each other. <coughs> B and C have to talk to each other. Having done that, they can then, then they know what's going on and they can update their local road to give us the same answer as the global road. And then we do the same thing again. And this is actually the way that the real scientific and technical programs written in parallel work. You have a communications phase and then you have a calculation phase. So you split the calculation up into two phases. One is when you communicate all the data you need and then you do a local calculation and then you go through it again. That's the way that <coughs> most scientific and technical codes work. So just to show you some code, the only slight complication, uh, well, different slide in the thought experiment is, is that I want you to, to think of being traffic on a roundabout, not traffic on a road. You might have asked, well, what happens at the right-hand side for the cars that go off the edge or on the left-hand side? Well, I'm going to say that we have periodic boundary conditions, which means the same thing as traffic is on a roundabout. So if a car goes off the right-hand side, it comes in on the left-hand side. That also has the nice effect of the number of cars as a conserved quantity, which makes things easier. So if I was to write some pseudocode, then this is what I could do. I could declare some arrays old, which is the current iteration, and new, which is the new iteration. And although only have n cells, where n was, say, 5, for the, sorry, this is the serial code, where n was 15, I actually have uh, n plus 2, um, um, I, have, I have n plus 2 um, cells in my array, because I have extra cells for the boundary. Now, you can... You can think about implementing these periodic boundary conditions in a number of different ways, but it turns out the simplest way to do it here, and the one which also makes it simplest in parallel, is to have special what you can call halo or ghost cells at the edges. So although my array is only like this for the road, I have special cells at the end. Okay. And I copy um, these values. So I set all zero equals all n, and all n plus one equals all to zero. So I copy this value here into here, and this value here into here, and that means that when I look up from this cell, I get x, which is the which is the value around here. So I'm doing the periodic value just by explicit copying. You can do it other ways, but it turns out that that's the, the it turns out that in this context, the easiest way to do it. I loop over iterations. I, I update the boundary conditions, and then I loop over all the cells, and these are the update rules. Uh, you might be surprised, I said there was eight possible states, but there's only four rules here. That's because if you're filmed, your state only depends on your upwind neighbors. And if you're empty, your state only depends on your downstream neighbors. So it's, although there's eight rules, there's actually four. And then we copy back for the new iteration. So that's it. Now, you might want to think about it. It's up to you if you want to think about this. Each of you can think about it in, in terms of this or this. Um, so I have the exercise sheet. The exercise sheet is really... Um, so this is really something just to think about now and um, to think about with a coffee break. So this is just a thought exercise. I think it is useful because, as I've said, although you may be itching to get programming and actually writing some code, it is really, really important to get the concepts um, uh, in. And this um, exercise, this traffic model, is surprisingly useful. It's useful for two reasons. A, I'll use it as a motivating example to say, well, you can do this in MPI. Why might you want to do this in MPI? Well, think about the traffic model, okay? Think about, you know, in the traffic model, you might want to do this, you might want to do that. But also, it's a surprisingly, although it's almost trivial, it's a surprisingly good model of how a large class of parallel applications work. If you think about 
uh, weather, weather forecasting, okay, the, the, the key point about, about the traffic model, I don't want to jump the gun, is that you only have to communicate the data at the boundaries. You have to communicate with your nearest neighbours, you only have to communicate the boundary data. And that's exactly true with weather modelling. Weather modelling, to a large extent, if a processor owns the bottom left-hand corner of, of, of Great Britain, you can update the weather there, but we have a finite wind speed. So some of the weather conditions will come in from your neighbours, but there's two important points. A, the weather will only come in from your nearest neighbours, okay, which in, in 2D is, 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 is eight, you know, up, down, left, right, near four diagonals. So you only have to communicate with your eight nearest neighbours, and secondly, you have to communicate a limited amount of data because the wind has a finite maximum speed. So you don't have to send all the information here. You only have to send the, the data which might have changed, which is, which is a, a thin sliver of data. So we'll come, maybe come back to this, and it'll become more obvious when you do the image processing example on, week, on the third day. But I think this traffic model is a surprisingly good analogy for a large class of science. 